we are going um, to Kentucky. We're going to uh, Berea College area, south of Lexington, Richmond area. Um, we're going to be, uh, today is Friday, the 22nd of April. Tomorrow we're, we're celebrating Jim Embry's birthday at a big, uh, what is it, birthday and butterflies celebration, I think he calls it. Uh, which is combination work party, potluck, uh, big old party. On our way, we're stopping at, um, we're, we're going to stop in uh, Huntington, West Virginia to go to the Wild Ramp Market and get some nice, uh, nice seafood. Um, we are going to Asheville after, after we're in Kentucky, Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and we're going to visit a bunch of awesome farm people. Um, that's the basic gist of it. That's at the foothills of Appalachian Mountains. It's nourished by the Kentucky River watershed and fed by the soil, heavily mineralizing limestone rock. That's who has made me who I am. And all of us. Okay? So we've begun coming out here. My cousin's here, Vaughn and Larry. Their grandfather lived here, my great uncle. And we'd come here and we would eat, you know, and pack food home with us and all of that. And then we would um, get water either from the wells or all the streams that flow through here go where? We can take care of it. So that's where I'm from. And this land here, we say we claim it from the 1800s. Usually you say, well, okay, if you bought that land from the white folk who stole the land, that's when you trace back to that land. Of course, in our case, it would be like 1890. Or I say, no, 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 no. We claim the land in the early 1800s. That's when we were brought here from Virginia in enslaved condition. And we came here, we worked this land. Grandmamas had babies in the field in the land. We put blood, sweat, and tears in the land. We learned to love the land. So we go back to the early 1800s, we say. Not just this farm, about 30, but the whole area here, which was the old, mostly a rural black community, okay? Uh, and the article that's in the, uh, I call it the Harvest Book, describes this farm. If you haven't read the article, I've got some extras over here, uh, but that article describes where you're sitting at now. And where you're sitting at, again, is an area where our folk were brought here to work the land. So because we were sometimes good folks who were enslaved, then we were allowed to begin a church in the 1850s on the farm plantation. The church over here is a result of that. It wasn't in that spot, but the church that began on the farm resulted in that church being formed. Concord, Prison there and Baptist Church. And then down the road, if you came up, the big trucks was a school called the Concord Colored School. But again, our, our great grandfather taught school there uh, and so forth. So, um, so anyway, I'm in this house over here. It's been about eight years. Wait, let me, 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 okay? Let me finish, okay? Thank you. So in this house and land here, okay. y'all better be careful when you move back to land folk been walking on for almost 150 years. And that house and outside, they be calling my name every day. When you gonna write about us? Get your ass up okay and get some work okay done, okay? Be talking, be, 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 be sending out energy, trust me. Every day, every night, it's what you get. So I'm just saying that while you're here, try to get a sense of that feeling because that kind of a feeling is what we need in so many ways all across the nation. We know something got to go back home to maybe where you family came from, but in some way or another, connect with some land somewhere. This land is also the land that was inhabited for almost 30,000 years by the Cherokee, the Shawnee, 
the Ouija board. So we need, to, we, we need to kind of like what we would call indigenize ourselves into like, wow, them folk might know something. They was here 30,000 years. <laughs> but you see, they might know something. So how do we kind of get back into that kind of uh, understanding is important. So we kind of give that kind of like an opening framework as we kind of go around and let people know kind of who's here, and maybe what brought you here and the kind of things you're doing. We'll have plenty of time during dinner, after dinner. What we generally do, it gets dark here about 8, 30, quarter to 9. If you want to stay uh, for late, that's fine. Sit out here. We have a bonfire over here. Uh, we do it every evening, the birthday. And right above the bonfire, if you haven't seen the, the Big Dipper in a long time, you can come right here and look right up there. It's the Big Dipper and other kind of stars. Okay? Uh, but it's, you know, the sunshine's gonna be a real pretty sunset as well. Uh, over there, take time to stop by and sit by the, uh, the, the little pond. Uh, I can tell a lie and say there's frogs in there, but you won't see them, they don't know you, they won't come up. One's about as big as my fist, okay? But uh, they were all got, I named them all after women. In my view, we've already named, enough stuff already about men, okay? These are all female frogs, okay? But anyway, there's, there's coins in there, gophers, that kind of thing. But again, when we came here, Larry and Vaughn, your know, cousins, uh, we're still, still here, you know, uh, grandparents, it's like a revival farm, two, two, two barns, you know, a shop, a shed, pigsty, chickens everywhere, guinea fowl, hogs, cows, mules, you know, just all kinds of you know, animals and a very viable small farm. But over time, real quickly, we're, all the time, the f small farm infrastructure began to be dismantled to make it difficult for small farmers to survive, okay? They used to milk cows in the big cans, put them down here on the corner, they'd come by and pick them up. Then it became, you didn't have, you didn't have 200 head of cattle, 200 head of, 200 head of dairy cow, hey, we ain't picking up your stuff. They began to dismantle stuff over the years that made it difficult for small farmers to earn a, a good living. Also, all around this area here, Concord, Waco, these are all small communities. But my great-grandmother's name was Amanda, okay? And Amanda was hired out um, down to uh, be a slave down in Boonesboro. And Jimmy drove you past there. But there's a house on the left called Lyle's House. It's going to be torn down very shortly. But she was hired out down there. And so the, that's my husband, I apologize. So, um, uh, the slave master's son thought she was a delicious little treat, and at a, a very young age, she became pregnant with my grandmother. She left down there and went back halfway between here and Jimmy's house and to her uncle's, and that's where my grandmother was born, there. But my grandmother, um, is a little interesting story, she uh, loved to dance. She met a man at one of those little dances, and uh, his name was Charlie Lyle. He was from Winchester, Kentucky. And again, the Lyle house, he was born down there. And uh, so at 16, her uncle decided and he put a little diary with her and get a man for her to marry. But my grandmother thought Charlie was the man. <laughs> so they had a secret plan. And so for a quarter, Charlie comes down by Boonesboro. There's a river down there. Takes the ferry over the river. My grandmother sits out and meets him. And for that quarter, the ferry man was to say that he had never seen her. Go back to Winchester get married. But my grandmother never, uh, her, her, her uncle never spoke to her again. So, but it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Delicious large red, and I have only one copy of that. I, I grew a five pounder and a, a nearly five pounder several years ago. One plant had two tomatoes that weighed over 10 pounds. And this is my son's father in law's tomato, and that's the word the red. These are the Cherokee purple. Oh, yeah. And then farther down this row, you have the Vincent Watts tomato, which is, uh, I'll show you in, in the book. And uh, one of the books, then the Willard Wind Tomato, which is on the cover of 
the other book and uh, then the um, um, oh, let me think of his name in Wayne, Wayne County Wendy Zeke Dishman to make it was on the cover of the paperback book and then on toward the end of this row is the um, is the uh, well, the yellow one, Renee. Renee Hensley Settlement. H Hensley Settlement. It's now part of the Cumberland Gap National Park. The Hensleys lived there for several generations and then left and sold their land to the Cumberland Gap National Park. But they, uh, that is their tomato that they developed uh, over several generations. And so uh, every tomato in here has a story. The Vincent Watts tomato was my friend who worked on it 52 summers. He died in 2008 at the age of 78, but he had worked on it 52 summers, selecting each year. This is the way you develop good tomatoes, is just simply pick your best tomatoes, your most disease resistant, the largest, best tasting every year after year. And that's what he did for 52 summers. And there have been articles about him all over the place. What's that? Is that an Oxford? Yes, these, the, this is the Ukrainian. Rene and I changed the name. It's called the Russian 117, but it was actually developed in Ukraine, and they should be the ones receiving credit for it, especially now that they're being attacked. 117, that's my lucky number. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> tomatoes that got burnt. Anybody want some crispy tomatoes? <laughs> Nobody can eat them. They're crunchy chips. <coughs> Tomato chips. I want to try. I resent. I mean, they're they're okay. Tomato chips. I do a lot of chilies too. I mean, we gotta eat them because. Gotta eat them up. There's nobody that's gonna buy something that looks like this. <laughs> Tomato chips. Not bad. <laughs> I wonder would they be high It helps. It so depends on the weather. In August, I mean, if I put these in a pot of soup, then I get tomato soup. Mm. Got my mouthful. It reconstitutes them when when they're leathery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's take the vehicle halfway up the road. We can kind of look at everything from there. What's in there? Yeah, actually, um, I, I guess the most significant thing for a lot of people is that three years after I took this photo in front of the old, it was the only uh, building with wood in the whole place because everything was wattle and daub. Uh -huh. That's the school. Uh -huh. And three years after that, she was married. That picture. So she looks like she's about what eight or nine years old. Yeah. She uh, twelve years she's old. Twelve she years was old. Married. No, oh, and, no, no. So at 12, she was. She was okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that I mean, she was such a. I loved her. Just I mean, I, I I had a really close relationship with her father. He was the youngest. Uh, technical, I don't know how you say that in English. He was. He would be kind of like an extension worker, mm -hmm. but he was so young because. All the men in Bombach were slaughtered by the melon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, the women were put into the church while they burned the thatch roof house. And this all happened in the 1980s. So you were there in the 90s? I was there in the 90s, and so he survived that because he was young. He looked young for his age. He so told like me. like a child, so they didn't kill him? They didn't kill him. They, they killed all the men because they could be gorillas, right? Mm -hmm. And this was, do you recognize this term called the scorched earth? Uh -huh. Like, got to drain the swamp. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Yeah. It's a policy. Yeah, Reagan, yeah. Reagan was good. Yeah, we studied about the that We actually talked that word. He and I are both world history teachers. So. You know yeah. what happened. Yeah, we did. Very, so yeah, very, very, we're in California, so we got a lot of the, yeah, so we got a lot a lot of the, the, the refugees mm -hmm. right? yeah. in our classrooms. Right? Yeah. So this picture is probably my favorite because this is a sacerdote, and he was doing the corn planting ceremony mm -hmm. 
at the corners of the field. This is with Kopalin since he was doing the ceremony for, you know, blessing all the seeds, even the ones that the birds would eat. And the, uh, um, I have a funny story about that because I, you know, I felt so honored to be able to go to that. And it was because I'd been hiking that many people hiked out to those old days and I had been working for a while there. And so, but the women were very shy. They did not speak Spanish and my pokemchi was mm -hmm. not very good yet. But I understood enough to know that they were, they kept calling me Kashlan, Kashlan. And instead of gringo, so I'm not that white, but <laughs> instead of gringo, you know, gringo is a Mexican term for gringo. Mm -hmm. So Kashlan, I had already learned as a butchered chicken. You know, a butchered chicken has a little... Uh, <laughs> A plucked chicken. A yeah, plucked yeah, chicken. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I was a plucked chicken. I'm like, I need a tail. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he kept saying, I'm like, you know, I kept saying, Don, Don Elijo, why are they calling me a plucked chicken? I'm like, what case? Why am I slime? And she's like, oh, it's just a word that we use. <laughs> it's trying to be nice. <laughs> 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 Oh, it's loud. Mm -hmm. This one is cool. Bottom, one bottom, single bottom pile. Mm -hmm. B, B, T, Avery, and Sons, Louisville. Okay. John Deere, this thing. Wow. These are antiques. Uh, this would have been a planter, probably. So this something. is what the Robinsons did. You know, they turned their, they turned all this stuff into a museum. Mm. Well, they were working on it. That's what they're trying to do. This is museum quality stuff. So up here is a double walnut floor for um, saving the seed. Really? For the, for the hemp. So when they when they broke it, it didn't fall. They were able to collect the seed. Wow. Whoa, Nelly. See, that. I watched all those barn I'm barn saver shows, and all this uh, barn all this was hewn by hand. All of these marks show right. the individual uh, axe and uh, saws, hand saws. I do that. That's, that. that's a closer look. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't blame you. I've spent <laughs> I've spent many hours in here. I mean, this is look at that beautiful. This wall. machine is something. Can't be that I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's so big. I can imagine that that was some kind of harvest machine. Yeah, that's what I think so too. I think you right. went, they drove over top. Yeah. Wow. What are you? Hmm. It's enormous. It is. I mean, I know people who know what this stuff is. You know what? Like, this still has some of the original hemp rope on it. No, no, that's steel. Wow. All right, all right, I'm coming. We're going out that time? Well, can we go up? It depends. Going up is kind of cool. I'd like to go the, up. The, the, it can. The question is, uh, can we go this way around this here? Sure. You probably won't. You can abandon ship and we'll meet you. <laughs> well, that might be the easiest way to get out. To get out? Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's see if I can make it a little easier. <laughs> okay. Like make a step here. Okay. What is that? Oh, this is another one. Look at that seat. Yeah. Well, this, air conditioned seat. this is a planter. See, it's mm -hmm. got the single, the plow. Oh no, this is a plow. Yeah, that's a plow. Put that di the single disc. Watch the head here, Hassan. Oh, for real? A little bit. I'll spot you, Benita. Okay. Elders, learning from elders, things like that. Uh, I work with kids, 
young kids who are um, in drug court. I've worked with, with people who, who are locked up in state penitentiary, federal prisons, uh, to work outside. And so not only does it grow food, we know all about all that. It grows food, absolutely feeds people, but also can transform people. It can take them out of their trauma into a position of being an agent of change. I've been about, you know, uh, several life about social justice for community activism my whole life. So, uh, so I kind of use gardening and farming to really defeat people, but also to help transform people's sense of self. Okay. Uh, I've worked with um, you know young kids. You know, all, work with kids who have what they call ADD, ADHD. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. They come out. They're already on drugs. You know, whatever. They come out. I was with all summer you know, garden projects. And then I recall uh, several years ago, uh, we had a, a potluck dinner at the end of the summer, a big garden tour, and the. Uh, Grandmother met me and says, "Oh, well, Mr. Henry, I've heard about you from my granddaughter Amanda, and uh, and she's been just loving this work outside every day. You do all this gardening and you work with elders. She says, you know, she has ADD, ADHD, and goes to the doctor every few months. And we went to the doctor back in the end of July. The doctor said, "Wow, what she's been doing this summer." I said, "What do you mean?" Oh, she's calm, she's peaceful. That seems erratic. She says, well, you know, she's out every day uh, working with that guy named Jim Emery, and they're outside every day. They're doing gardening every day. They're doing community work every day. Every day. Yeah. So, so we know that there's a book you might know it by Richard Boo called um, No Child Left Outside. It talks about what he called nature deficit disorder. A lot of the lack of civility among young people, a lot of the behavior that's they regard as regain. Some kids, you know, go to school and they track them. They say, well, you've got ADD, ADHD, I'm going to put you in special ed, or you need special help. Okay? And not the, But part of the problem, not being outside enough. Okay? So, and we've, and we've witnessed that with kids over the last... 20 years. We've done a lot of work with a lot of kids, what you call the alternative schools. That's where all the, the bad, all the badass kids go. Like on a conveyor belt to prison. And we say, get them outside. Get them outside. So, um, so anyway, I try to approach things in that kind of a way, depending upon who they might be. I try to broaden the topic of organic agriculture, a much broader, a much broader kind of uh, conversation. You know, if you're a farmer, I'm saying, hey, yes, you ought to go this route because it's healthier across the board. It's healthier for people, for the environment, for the economy, because if, if the environment is suffering, the economy is going to suffer. Okay? It's all tied together. And as a furthermore, uh, when it comes to your family, you want your family eating the best quality food. Okay? You want your family to eat, your children, your grandchildren, go out to your farm, like we get in here. They can go along and eat anything without any fear of ingesting chemicals. Okay? Uh, so I try to do it beyond just the financial piece of it. Oftentimes, it's part of the focus conversation. Trying to help people see there's a larger dimension. It's a larger dimension. Yes, I understand you have a farm, you want to be viable economically, I understand that. But you have some larger responsibilities as just that. And and I understand you can handle all the financial end and from my viewpoint you can handle the financial end make your farm more viable economically, organically, but you, have, you can also serve a much larger purpose. Much larger purpose. Because some of the things that kids are suffering from 
all the chemicals that we're ingesting. That's what drives a pathway crazy. Okay? Even too many chemicals. You know? I mean, you, you read it, you know, you read a package of food, and it's potato <laughs> chips. There are too many words that you don't quite sure how to pronounce, but you shouldn't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. You know, a friend of mine, bless her heart, came to the dinner party uh, Saturday, bought a big box of, box of chips, was trying to be helpful. I read the ingredients. It's like 20 different things. And some words, as you know, you can't even pronounce these long chemicals. I said, wait a minute. It's potatoes. It's oil and salt. That's all you need. And potato chips. Fifteen different things, you know. So, uh, so I say I try to tie it into things like that. That uh, you know the reason why. Oftentimes, you know, when it comes to kids are African American and special ed, we're the ones that have the biggest percentage. Okay, the trap is special ed. And then, of course, as you know, then our kids, our, our, our folk, also get tracked more in the prison. So these things are all interconnected. Okay. They're all interconnected. I said, so I'll give an examples, like with Amanda, uh, whose grandmother said, yeah, she's really improving her behavior. The doctor said, it wasn't because of the drugs she was taking, because she out there every day, the crazy ass young memory, okay? <laughs> And they run around, you know, with, 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 with um, we call it the Youth Green Corps, that we called it. And uh, we got kids who were paid by the city. And then they were assigned to me. And then we did a lot of work in, in like in senior, center, senior centers, putting gardens in there, okay? And they met the elders, okay? So around, talk to them, things like that. We worked um, in, even in cemeteries to help do cemetery cleanup. Um, then we would also do art uh, in Lexington. As a matter of fact, there's a couple of um, uh, art projects that we did that are still standing. So we would uh, create art from found objects, paint them up, and then put them on the walls of schools. Then we built a bench down by our, down there uh, near a coffee shop. It's called Straw Bell Construction. We would take straw, a couple of chicken wire, then take cement and sand. Put it on there. Get a whole little park bench out of that. Okay. So um, the kids did that oh, about eight years ago, and it's still there. And people would go there, sit on it. When it was first built eight years ago, people loved it so. It was so colorful. Folks would come and take pictures there, sitting on it. And then a wedding party was having a wedding come across the street at a church and saw it. Oh, wow, that is so pretty. Let us go over there as a bride and groom and their, with their entourage and get a picture on that park page. Yeah. Yeah. What is the potato tomato? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, these are, this literally, this story is really fun. About 1911, I mean 2011, right? I found a desert potato that had a fruit on it. And I stuck it, you know, I said, because you, whenever you get potato fruit, you want to save them because it's brand new genetics. All potatoes are clones, right? But if you get them, you get fruits, then you have all new genetics. You get a totally new potato. No clone, you know, it's, it's had sex, it's a different thing. So I saved that seed and I sowed it. And when the seed came up, it came up half potato and half tomato. Well, well, eight scientist friends all say it could only happen in the lab. And I, say, even there. <laughs> and I say, never underestimate nature. Because you know? literally, they said, you must have mixed up potato and tomato seed. If you've ever grown potato seed, it is tiny. You cannot mix it up if you've been growing for years, right? So what happened was, tomatoes came up. I really didn't even want tomatoes, so I stuck them along my driveway, and they barely survived. They then got lost in a drawer. Nate lost half of what I had. I planted a few. I still have a few of those seeds. These are prime. I put one in, one came up, and when I tasted it, it was like I thought to myself, the perfect combination of sour, of, of tart, and sweet. Yeah. And so That's I traced it. The texture's an ideal slicer. One came out a huge beefsteak, but unfortunately I think that crossed. I gave it to somebody that had a really close target. Because these guys are promiscuous, they cross. You know? 
right now. Uh, this is black rohash. That is growing up here. Uh, medicinal, we'll see another thing of it later, but just to kind of get our eyes attuned to some of these species. We've got lots of trillium. Some of, these are the nodding trillium, and some are just blooming now. We'll see a lot of other varieties. Uh, we have bellflower, yellow bellflower flowering right now. All sorts of stuff. Solomon seal is just starting to flower with, you'll see the flowers underneath these plumes. Um, as we go along the walk, but just to get ourselves attuned. There's also some bloodroot or Sanvenaria canadensis right at the front you may have seen under that autumn olive. There's a nice specimen there. It's that very calming. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. Ooh, hoo, hoo. yeah, and now look for those. Well. So right, the bloodroot flower comes up earlier, as, as most of us probably know, and the seed pods are really um, swelling right now, so it's a lovely time. And we'll go ahead and bag some of those seed pods next week of select ones that we'd like to some of the larger ones usually are in the most developed leaves uh, to then keep that seed in, in a nursery style um, instead of letting it flow out because that's what bloodroot seeds do. They get so tight that they explode. Um, you'll also see a lot of uh, wild ginger species and, and probably more. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Perfect. So take everything and take a picture of it. So yeah, just like plant identification and then we can talk a little bit about opportunities for propagation, seed growing and stuff like that with this group. Uh, but you'll see a lot of these plants again, we like to grow um, in diverse kind of companionship, even when we have a bed that's like just golden seal, you'll see other plants um, either interplanted by us or that's the way these plants really like to grow and thrive is in um, companionship. So that's something to consider in your cultivation and then and yeah, so this is kind of an overflow nursery where we will just bury um, flats with holes in them so that we can keep track of things. So we wanted them to be in touch with the, with the forest soil because a lot of these species are dependent on the biology there for various parts of their life cycles. Uh, particularly for germination and we also want to avoid having to like put them in a cooler for 30 days or whatever so they're going through those stratification those cold and warm cycles in their natural way um, so we've found you know good germination for a lot of species by these kinds of methods this is kind of the the low-tech version with stuff we already had um, and we have a whole bunch of ginseng seedlings for example right in here um, and you'll see a bunch more ginseng later on. But here are some coming in. These three leaf is what a ginseng seedling looks like. So these are our um, fresh sown ginseng seeds. You might see also that you can go through a process similar to tomato and do your uh, ferment off that, that berry and then go through a stratification process. Also works great and it's better if you need to hold seed of golden uh, ginseng and also golden seal would be in that uh, department as well. Um, but I, if it can and if it's close, I really prefer the fresh seeding method and we've had great success with it with both ginseng and golden seal in recent years. So these are fresh seeded in September of uh, 2020, coming into their second year and we're starting to see uh, what we would now consider a kind of a, a whole plant, not just a seedling. It's starting to get more than three leaves and sometimes a, a second prong on the stem and, and possibly root underneath. Mm. Um, so that's a little bit about a nursery. Uh, other plants over here, we have some, uh, oh yeah, they're about to put off some male flowers. These are Camelarium lupium, or what's, it's another medicinal herb. Um, for lack of better term, it's another women's herb. I'm probably not to use that terminology because it's very generic. Um, but um, these are the rosettes here and they're just starting to flower. So this is a, a beautiful mm. plant. It is um, an at-risk plant and is challenging to cultivate um, generally over time. That said, we've had some great um, mm -hmm. growers in recent years um, cultivate it by seed in, in plants and such. So it has uh, separate male and female plants and very different flower structures. It's a gorgeous plant. It's one of those like stunners when the flower is totally out, but also um, in need of uh, protection on some level. We, uh, as, as researchers and in being involved in some of these plants collections in North Carolina, we received um, some from a huge coaching last year, or two years ago now. We planted it out last year, um, like a 40 liter backpack full of these tiny camelarian roots. And sure that somebody might have been getting a couple hundred bucks a pound, but that's a thousands of plants to make a couple pounds. So. Um, so that was unfortunate, but uh, we were able to do some uh, research and observation on that material, tra re-transplanting mature wild um, Camillaria luteum. So looking forward to that. Yeah, isn't that pretty? So those are coming out like this, and then we'll probably get some real tall um, female fronds as well.
Yeah, so that's the, the Camillarium Lucia. And actually, Jean Harrison uh, over in Weaverville, Red Root Natives, she's one of the first people I've seen that has done a nice um, in cultivation from seed. She's selling them by the flat now, so she's doing well enough that she's getting good flat germination of those. So that's nice to see. Um, and I know if it hasn't been mentioned, uh, propagation and planting stock of woodland botanicals is huge right now. We are putting, we have some uh, technical support grants out all over uh, North and South Appalachia for one of our forest farming projects for forest farming assistance. I'll give you guys some of those um, and, and gals part of some of those applications because it's in for Virginia and other states. Go <laughs> and pick some of mine off. They're coming up again. Not. Uh, you got some uh, elder elderberry. Yeah, so good eyes noticing some um, elderberry coming up, and we do some live staking of elderberry, and, and this would be a good mm -hmm. idea for the food forest too, in areas that we want elderberry, but also as part of erosion packages. So we oftentimes we'll mix like a dogwood and an elderberry, a cheap way to propagate them through the stakes, um, okay. because they'll grow new leaves off off cut sticks if you do it the right time of year. Really? So yeah, so we've done that along some of the um, berms yeah. and Did you show that to me when we get to Of course. What, when do you think it's too late to do that? Well, so we did it kind of an observational experiment with that this season because the grower that we cut um, the native elderberry cuttings from had COVID when we were supposed to go there. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to do it two weeks later and they had started to leaf out. Uh, we're probably only getting 30-40% survival once they start to leaf out and mm -hmm. probably even a week before that because their mechanisms are doing all that. So we get more like 60-80% to 80 if we do it um, in the spring before leafing out. So uh, more of a dormant cutting. So we see this all over the hills. This stuff. The may apple. This is the one, yeah, that I'm obsessed yeah. with. I keep pointing it out the whole drive. Did you see more doubles? There, I mean, these, I, I just mean doubles. I mean, flowering oh, oh, ones. These yeah. are all doubles. Yeah, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see the flowers. So they, they put up, this is liable to be one plant, all connected underground like a mushroom by rhizome. And uh, the single leafed ones, like this one, it's just a single leaf. Uh -huh will not make a flower. And then the doubles, like this one, will make a flower. And that's the ones that make the fruit that you have to fight the box turtles and the raccoons for. And the, they say that the germination of the seeds goes up to about 80, 90% from like 30 or 40, once the seed passes through a box turtle. That makes um, a lot of sense. <laughs> but it's, uh, the whole plant is poisonous except for the flesh of the ripe fruit, which is maybe a little bit poisonous still, but I, it makes a delicious, <laughs> like pineapple flavored jam. That's if you get enough. Is that how you prefer to prepare them jam. as a jam? Yeah, I I, I I mash. I take this, you know, I take the pulp, put it through a colander with my hands to get, save the seeds, and you don't want to eat the seeds because they're also poisonous. And then um, all the pulp goes down. I add sugar and boil it down, and it's. Fantastic. Awesome. But uh, yeah, it's it's a little, it makes my mouth tingle a little bit. <laughs> but the, apparently indigenous people, the, the, the story I've heard is that indigenous people use this, um, use this root. Uh, it was used very sparingly medicinally, but it was um, a well-known plant that people would use to commit suicide. 